Have you ever had an instance where you felt God was showing you something? Yesterday, I got a text message that a friend that I've worked with many times over the past few years, he, he died, had a heart attack, passed away. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but I want you to think about that question. Have you ever had an instance where you felt God was showing you something? I want you to think about that while we're reading today. We're going to read Luke 13. This is Nobody's Fault Podcast. My name is Cash. We're going to look at three things today. Be like Jesus. Pursue your purpose. Bring glory to God today. That's what we're going to look at. I want you to think, have you ever had an instance where you felt God was showing you something? Uh, Luke chapter 13. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Gal- Galatians, no, Galileans. I'm going to start over. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up this ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well, all good. But if not, you can cut it down. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It's like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And again he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. He went on his way through the towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen, and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, open up to to us. Then he will answer, answer, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. 
But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is nearing the end of his ministry here. Can you see his lack of patience for the religious people? Can you see it? It's in a bunch of places there. And for Herod, Herod killed his cousin, John the Baptist. It doesn't look like he has much patience for Herod either. He knows that Herod is going to kill him. He already knows that. But he has a purpose. He has a job to do. What's our job? Be like Jesus. Become more like Jesus. Pursue our purpose and bring glory to God today. Jesus was a man on a mission. Verse 32, I just said, uh, he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I am casting out demons, performing healings today and tomorrow, and on the third day I reach my goal. Herod wanted to see Jesus perform some miracles. Herod was curious about Jesus. He's like, I'd like to see a miracle too. Jesus says, I'm doing miracles today and tomorrow. Why don't you come today or tomorrow? We probably can't say the word that Jesus called Herod. Honestly. The Bible lists it as a fox. I heard that the Greek word was vixen, and there's another name for that. So what was Jesus' goal? He was pressing on to his goal. His goal was to bring glory to God. Bring glory to God. His, when he died, he said, it is finished. What was finished? God designed purpose for the man, Jesus, while he was on this earth. Jesus did his work as an example for us. When he died, he said, it is finished. If Jesus is a model for us, shouldn't we also be prepared to say it is finished, the purpose that God had for us? So what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? He would bring glory to God today. Jesus is our role model. Each day of his life, he spent bringing glory to God because God gave him a purpose. He fulfilled it. So we should always be striving to make our lives look more and more like Jesus. He's our example. His purpose was to bring glory to God. So should ours be. So he completed the tasks that God gave him to do. So should we. He was fruitful with, it, with his life. We should be fruitful too. Is any of this easy? No. He, he, he tells us in verse 23, in verse 24, And some said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and not be able to. That's a warning of preparation. Preparation. 
strive to enter. That takes effort. That striving is an effortful thing. So, we're supposed to be leading a fruitful life just like Jesus. The Christian life is a journey that requires intense focus. Now, picture yourself at boot camp. You're being trained to be a warrior. You're in warrior training. So, about, about 10 years ago or so, I'm not sure exactly when, I felt God speaking to me. And what he was saying is, what I, the impression I got, the words I heard, where I want you to teach. I want you to teach. He, he, I was probably about 50 years old. I want you to teach. So, I've been trying to pursue that purpose, um, my God-given purpose, since I was a young man. I, I became a Christian probably 19, 20 years old. But I haven't had very many reliable teachers or role models along the way. Right? I, I, I didn't have guys guiding me, and what does this look like? So, I'm trying to pursue this purpose, and I started asking God, teach what to who, teach what to who. Each day I press into that, I feel like the message gets clearer. Teach God, or teach, teach my people to recognize my voice. I feel like that's what, what God's pushing me to, calling me to guiding me to. So I kept asking, teach what to who, teach what to who. So I've been intentional as I possibly can with as many people as I can in trying to figure out what this is in any way I can. So December 2022, I started a little 12-question survey. On January 5th, 2023, I had my friend complete the survey. This guy, I just got a text message. He passed away yesterday. He's 63 years old, just a couple years older than me. That little survey, by me pursuing my purpose, I asked my friend, I'm like, do you, have you had an, I, uh, the, the question was on the survey, and I looked back, I, I don't have his answer to that question. Do you feel like God's been showing you something? Another question on the survey is, if you die today, do you think God would let you live forever with him in heaven? I did write a yes down there, but I didn't record his answer. Do you feel like God's been showing you something? The other thing is he didn't identify himself as a Christian. I, I, I asked people, do you, do you consider yourself Christian, atheist, something else, some other faith? I asked that question. He said something else. So now my friend is gone and I can't finish the conversation. Th that survey opened up a conversation with us and I talked to him over the last, the last year several times about faith. We worked on several projects together. He's gone. I can't finish the conversation. So today I'm heartbroken. I I'm not kidding. This bothered me yesterday. I was, I was in a way, angry. But man, do you think I have more focus today? You're darn right. I'm praying that my conversations with that guy were fruitful. About a year ago, the wife of someone I've known for about 20 years called. She asked me to pray with her dying husband. I hope it was effective. Only God knows. But isn't that a little late? Isn't that a little late? The guy's about my age. His wife calls me. He's dying. I'm going to put the phone by him. I know he can hear you. He probably can't answer. I talked to him about Jesus. I said, it's never too late to call on the name of Jesus. Why do I bring this up today? First of all, it's on my mind. Second, we are supposed to be like Jesus, all of us. We're supposed to pursue our purpose. We're supposed to bring glory to God today. Bring glory to God today. But here's the problem. How do you know a purpose when you can't hear God, when you can't see Him at work, when nobody's teaching you what to look for? I think this is where the number one glaring weakness of the church from Jesus' time to our time is. We're not teaching people how to recognize the voice and leadership of God. That comes through the Holy Spirit. The church acts like they're afraid of the Holy Spirit half the time.
So I think Jesus showed us some powerful things in this chapter. Verse 5. Verse 5, he says, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. The Herod was trying to get rid of the Christians. They were having battles. And, and in the United States at this time, it was kind of a battle of like the urban people versus the country people. Like picture Texas and Florida battling New York. And the religious people were like the New York. And the Jesus followers were like Texas and Florida. There was conflict going on. And the city people, the, the religious leaders, killed a bunch, of the, um, a bunch of the Christians. And that's how this, this chapter opened up. They were, they were complaining about the blood of of the Galileans who Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. They were angry. They were upset. So Jesus said, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. But repent. Repent. We got to get to know Jesus. Becoming saved or whatever you want to call it, becoming a Christian, when you Put your faith in Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. That's the first step. Now the Holy Spirit comes in. He is there to guide you into a relationship with Jesus. I didn't see evidence of a relationship with my, my two, these two guy friends I just talked to you about. I didn't see it in their life. You know, you'd like to say, oh, he's a good guy, he's a good guy. The guy who passed away yesterday, he was a good guy. He's a really good guy. He'd help you at the drop of a hat. But in the kingdom of God, that's not enough. Jesus wants a relationship with us. So, first, have you invited Jesus to be your leader and asked him to deliver you from the bondage of sin? Jesus is the only way to heaven, eternal life, to new life here on this earth. He's the only the only way you can defeat sin in your life. He said, no man comes to the Father except through me. That's through Jesus. There's no other way. Verse 7, Jesus says to the vine keeper, look, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? But he answered, Sir, leave it alone this year, and I'll dig around it and put on some fertilizer. Maybe, maybe we'll give it a chance. God is merciful. He's giving us all today. He's giving us another chance to get our eyes on Him. Today is a period of grace. Today. Today. He's giving you a chance. He'll fertilize you. But man, His patience runs out. It's not an unlimited time we have. There's an expiration date. And then he says, and if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. Is our fruit from religion? It will get burned up. But if our fruit is from the Spirit, we will pass through fire. There's a number of stories. If you reread this chapter, the religious people are going to get burned down. They don't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. They don't have a relationship with Jesus, with God. They don't have that relationship. And he says, depart from me. I didn't know you. We need to be like Jesus. We each have purpose. Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Our purpose again, bring glory to God today. Bring glory to God today. You only have today, maybe. Don't count on tomorrow. What are the tools of our purpose? We, we have purpose tools. We're supposed to be sharpening these tools, using them, building things with them. Number one, you have a testimony. 
That's a tool of purpose, your testimony. You, we're supposed to have spiritual eyes and ears. We're supposed to be able to answer that question. Have you had an instance where you felt God was showing you something? You need to answer my question. Do you have spiritual eyes and ears? This is part of your tools of purpose. Number three, tool of, pur- tool of purpose. Are you teachable? Can God teach you something? Can he show you something and you'll actually change your path? Or are you just so stuck in your way, you're going to stick with it? You're too soft. Jesus said that the way is narrow. So, tools of purpose. Number four, spiritual fruit, like patience, love, kindness, goodness. Galatians 5. Read that. 5.22, I think. Number five, tools of purpose, spiritual purpose. You have a spiritual purpose. Pursue that. You have a spiritual timeline. You have to be oriented towards the future. This is one of your tools. Get oriented towards the future. You have a future-facing timeline. Get your eyes on Jesus. Listen for the Holy Spirit. Watch where He's taking you. And then go there. Go there. Obey. Follow. And we have a spiritual roadmap. That spiritual roadmap is the example of Jesus and the guide the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's our roadmap. Jesus is the destination. Become more like Him. The Holy Spirit will get you there. Acts twenty or Acts two twenty two. It says, "You have revealed the paths of life to me. You fill me with gladness in Your presence. In Your presence. In Your presence. We've got to be in God's presence every day." 1 Corinthians 10.31 So then, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of our great God. That's your purpose. 1 Corinthians 10.31 So your purpose is not simply to be a greeter at church. Your purpose is not simply to show up for one hour at one building and do one task one day of the week. That is not purpose. You have to have a purpose-oriented life that consumes every hour of your waking existence. Whether it's being a mom, a teacher, an employee, an employer, a student, a friend. Your purpose should consume every hour of your life. We need to be laser-focused on the face of Jesus and where would He have us go. We got to be able to discern his voice, his calling, his direction every hour of the day. It's not on Sunday for a few minutes. Uh, Mark 13:34. It's like a man away on a journey who, when he left home, put his servants in charge, each with his particular task, and also ordered the doorkeeper to be continually alert. We're supposed to be continually alert. So, here's some things we've got to know about our own life. Things are hard. God is good. You're going to die. Be prepared for that. Be like Jesus when he can say, It is finished. I ran the good race. I fought the good fight. We're all going to meet Jesus face to face again. we got to be ready. So focus our eyes and heart, our ears on God, the Father, and things will work out according to His plan. Instead of worrying about which day or hour is the end, I think we should all be asking God, what is your plan for me? What would you have me do? How do you want me to grow? How do you want me to use my testimony? There's only one way to fulfill this purpose. We've got to have relationship with the Holy Spirit. Relationship right now. He's going to teach us how to do this. You don't want to be this person in this chapter, verses 26, 27, 29. We ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And yet he will say, I do not know where you are from. Leave me, all you evildoers. 
the good things you do don't count if you don't know Jesus, if you're not under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We've got to tune in. It says they will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and will recline at the table of God. Don't worry about everyone else. Well, don't worry. Well, they don't have the Bible in this language in this country. That's not unfair. You worry about yourself. You have it. You use it for you right now. Don't worry about everybody else. Worry about you. So we've got to repent and be saved. We need to pursue a relationship with the Holy Spirit so He can transform us. Then we can bring glory to God. We're supposed to be like Jesus, pursue our purpose, bring glory to God. But first we've got to hear Him. That's my purpose, help you hear God. That's what we're doing this for. Please subscribe, share this with a friend. There's links in the notes. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.